Well, thank you, Alec, and thank you to the organizers, uh, to Karim and Adriana and everyone for accommodating me. Um, I made it here at last. So I, I come to you from uh, Canberra, Australia. Um, it's evening time here, and I think it's early morning where most of you are. Um, I hope my internet is going to uh, be as accommodating as the organizers of this committee, uh, this workshop. Okay, so um, I will share my screen and get going. I will attempt to share my screen. And hopefully everyone can see that. I'll, I'll assume if I don't get interrupted, you can. Um, so the title of my talk uh, for my first two lectures here will be, um, original title was some new trends and some old lessons in geophysical inversion. And uh, an alternate title is uh, a focus on emerging directions in geophysical inversion. Now, I know we have a, uh, a, a mixture of audience members, and um, I want to uh, give an introduction to inversion, so it puts us all on the same page, and talk about a few areas which I think are interesting, it's a personal view, and which I think have potential um, for um, important applications in the next decade or so. Um, but yeah, as, uh, as a famous physicist said, prediction is difficult, especially about the future. So um, there is a, a review chapter associated uh, with this. Um, uh, there's going to be a, a publication associated with this workshop and associated with this talk with the same title of Emerging Directions in Geophysical Inversion. And that's co-authored between uh, myself and Andrew Valentine at Durham University. Now, um, uh, there is a draft of that available under review, and the topics covered in that are listed at the bottom here, um, from uh, aspects of sparsity constrained inversion, optimal transport, ensemble methods, a whole series of things where we think they are emerging, and there's a summary in there. And it's really the areas in red that I want to talk about today. Uh, sparsity, optimal transport, uh, generative uh, methods and surrogate modeling, part of machine learning, and also physics informed neural networks, all particularly how they influence um, uh, geophysical inversion and how they're already being used in geophysical inversion. And I think it's an exciting time to be alive, essentially. Um, okay, so I want to start um, very uh, in a very basic manner, uh, introduce some concepts which hopefully will be familiar to many people. Um, so data, data everywhere. Um, it was estimated uh, more than a decade now ago by Gantz in 2010, that the global data collection rate from all sources was increasing at 58% equal to 1.2 times 10 to the 21 bytes per annum, which is more than the estimated number of stars in the universe. So an enormous growth, and we've seen that in many areas of um, our discipline. Um, there's some examples there of how data sets have grown. So these huge volumes of data present challenges for data custodianship, um, but they also lead to new ways of, of drawing inferences about the real world or about the physical world around us. Um, as we change the, the style of data, we change the way um, we go about uh, making inferences. Um, but here's the basic paradigm that I've worked on for many years now, and many people will be familiar with, which is um, uh, classifying forward and inverse problems. Now, um, the forward problem being a deductive process, where if we take some process in the Earth, some assumption about the Earth, it might be, in my case, a seismic structure of the Earth or um, properties of an earthquake, um, or it may be anything, it might be a weather system. And simulation of physical phenomena is the forward problem, which is where we go from the left to the right. Um, typically, in, uh, it may be anything from simple um, uh, algebraic equations to solve to all the way to 
solutions of complex um, ordinary differential or partial differential equations. Um, but they particularly then make predictions, predictions that can be compared to observations, um, predictions of seismic waves uh, as a function of uh, position in the Earth, um, or the weather, or simply um, the ages of rocks for a geochemist, a geochronologist. But they are compared to observations, the comparable corresponding observations, and the inverse problem is to go backwards, to take observations and try and constrain properties or um, even the whole Earth, but usually properties. And that goes into parameter fitting, data assimilation, Bayesian inference, and that's an inductive process because we are trying to go backwards to, to find out where the, um, what model or what representation led to the observations that we have. Um, some would argue forward problems are easier to solve than inverse problems. Some might argue it the other way around. But I always, um, come back to Samuel Carlin, 1983, who is a famous statistician. He said, um, the purpose of models is not to fit the data, but to sharpen the question. And that's always stayed with me because we're not, when we solve an inverse problem, we're always um, at best finding some approximation to the thing we don't know about, approximation to the earth. Um, it is not the Earth, it is always some limited, inadequate approximation. And finding such models, the purpose of it is then to sharpen the questions. And I think that's a good way of viewing all of inversion as asking questions. Now, to ask a question, you need to know what you're asking a question about. And um, that typically means or doesn't have to mean discretizing your unknowns in some way, um, which often leads to parameter estimation problems. And to do that, we need some sort of basis function. And I've represented it here simply as a sum of some known basis functions, phi j times constant mj. And we would be looking for the constant having assumed and posed the basis functions. And here are some examples, local supported basis functions, uh, that uh, are limited in space, they represent in some sense an average of the property you're interested in, a localized average in some way, or global supported basis functions. Classic examples being uh, Fourier uh, analysis or Fourier components of a signal. Um, and there are things that go in between, things that are both local support but have finite frequency, which is where wavelets come in, or curvelets. So we make inferences about continuous function uh, by using some sort of basic function and everything then that we recover or we learn is through that lens of the basis functions we've chosen if we're looking at a discrete problem. We have to recognize that. Um, and they're often chosen to suit some phenomena, to suit the physics of the problem or for convenience or hopefully something which is meaningful in the question you want to ask of the data. Okay, so classes of inverse problem. Um, um, typically, uh, the simplest one is linear systems of equations where D is our data, M is our model, and G is some perhaps higher dimensional matrix where um, it is known and it is a constant. And that makes a linear problem. Solving linear systems of equations is a, um, a, a pastime of many of us and doing that efficiently when problems are large is, is, a, is a matter of um, often research, but there are many, many ways of going about that. And nonlinear and discrete is when we don't have a linear problem, we simply have a function of some model parameters M. We're trying to find M given D and given G, whether G be a matrix of above or some function below. So nonlinear and discrete, but we also have linearized and discrete which is how we typically solve a nonlinear problem by perturbing the data and perturbing the model and actually uh, forming a linear systems equations of changes to some reference model given uh, differences between observations and predictions, which is our delta D. Much less studied, but also um, important are linear and nonlinear continuous problems as represented by uh, my two 
um, equations below there. Um, these are um, typically because we have big computers these days, we like to discretize problems and we usually cast one of the um, uh, more complex problems into simpler problems as in above. Okay, now there are two common approaches to inversion, two classes of approach. The left hand side representing what we might call model building, um, uh, trying to find some uh, set of unknowns M which satisfy constraints of um, trying to fit data, as we see on the left hand side. Uh, here I've got a simple least squares or L2 norm of data misfit, plus some sort of regularization possibly. Um, but the key distinguishing between the left and the right is that we're typically through, uh, trying to solve an optimization problem on the left and seeking some um, optimal model in some sense. And on the right um, is a different class of problem where um, we are not trying to find a model per se, but trying to find some function over the model parameters, which might be a probabilistic interpretation of the problem. And this is essentially well known to be Bayes rule, where we have a posterior distribution um, represented here as P of M given D, um, uh, which is uh, proportional to a likelihood, the probability of the data given the model, times the probability of the model. And this is a very popular way, uh, increasingly so in recent years, I think, um, a way of trying to attack inverse problems in that we usually end up resulting into sampling. So rather than one model on the left, we might look for an ensemble on the right, which was uh, distributed approximately according to um, uh, the way that the data support the model. So high concentrations of samples are where the data is, uh, where the model is um, uh, well-defined and we can uh, use the spread or properties of an ensemble to try and understand uncertainty, constraints and ask questions. Okay, so here's my discrete linear problem, classic least squares, fitting uh, uh, Newton's laws of motion, a trivial example. Okay, so in this case, overdetermined least squares problems we can solve, and we've known how to solve these for many, many years, and we've got more adventurous by solving bigger problems. And this is a useful um, starting point for many cases. It's not um, going to work in all problems because. Uh, even a, a, a linear, because problems can be underdetermined. Um, but a classic problem just to uh, put there as a reference. Okay, but we can quickly move into problems of interest where they are nonlinear. Um, now, I'm going to hopefully show you a model here. Um, here's a calculation I did a couple of years ago. On the top left, I hope you can see there a panel of four. Um, images where this is simply a one-dimensional seismic model of the crust or the, uh, the, uh, the crust and the upper mantle, no, it's mainly the crust and lithosphere, um, which is a shear wave speed as a function of depth in layers, very, very simple. And from that, we can make a prediction of um, this uh, blue curve here, which is what we call a seismic receiver function. Um, it's a, uh, a product of, um, seismograms that is um, constrains the near uh, surface structure. The blue is predicted. Gray here is my sort of synthetic um, observe, observed inverted commas, receiver function with noise. Um, now, what I'm gonna do is play a little um, model, uh, play a little uh, movie, and you'll see the blue curve here is just the differences between what we might call predicted blue curve and the observed inverted commas gray curve. So we would like the blue to be as small in amplitude as possible, then the fit is best. And on the left hand side, I'm just plotting essentially the sum of the squares of the areas of the blue. Now, what I'm going to do is move, change the velocity model, and I'm changing the wave speed here, the seismic wave speed in one layer. And as you do that, you see the changes in the um, predicted receiver function. The differences in blue, they change up and down. It looks quite complicated, but actually, if you look at the misfit, it's nicely almost quadratic. Yeah. There's a well-defined minimum, and at that minimum, as the red dot goes down, 
um, is the place where we're at at any one time. The red dot hits the minimum. The fit between the blue and the gray is as good as possible. And uh, it's at an optimum level. So this problem is actually quite simple to solve if we're looking for seismic velocities. And I'm only varying one velocity here. Okay, but below is exactly the same problem, exactly the same setup. But what I'm gonna do is not vary the velocity, um, but vary the structure of the model by moving the red dot up and down and redefining the layers as we move through. So if I click on here, hopefully you can see the movie. Um, hopefully you can see that. Um, now the uh, structural components, so the velocities are not changing, the velocity is moving through the model and it's changing the model structurally with different thickness of layers, etc. Now, this type of change is much more complicated. Um, the waveforms jump around, move through, the blue goes up and down. But if you look at the misfit as that function, that one parameter, the red dot moves up and down, it hits a global minimum around sort of 20, uh, not 20, yeah, uh, 20 kilometers, which is where the optimal model is. But you see lots of local minima. So this is a nonlinear problem and it creates a lot of difficulties, but it's actually the same problem. It's just that one problem, in one case, we we'll vary one type of parameter, and in the other, we're varying a different class of parameter. So problems can have this mixed character. And on the right-hand side, you see the same thing as on the left, but as a function of two layers, you see two layer thicknesses. And you see these enormous mountains of, of insignificance behind that can make optimization very difficult. The white area in the foreground is where the global minimum is. So dealing with this type of class of problem as we vary two, three, four, or as many unknowns as we want, becomes exceedingly complex. The character of the misfit landscape is a function also of how we measure the fit to the data. So this is what I mean by a highly nonlinear problem. Now, um, having paused just for a moment then on um, my, my introduction to inverse problems, we have to deal with linear and nonlinear, they come in all shapes and sizes. I want to concentrate on a very particular feature called sparsity. Now, sparsity means emptiness. So, unlike what I've just described here, if we have a linear problem and which is non unique, um, the left hand side is a unique. Our misfit function is nicely quadratic and linear, and everything is wonderful. Our hand side indicates where it's non unique, and we have a, um, a, a region where all of the fits of the data are given by this misfit surface. The misfit surface is a, a valley and it's a constant. And along the line across the minimum, there, there's no unique conditions along there, and we have an underdetermination. So in these problems, if we're trying to build a single model or find some uh, preferred model, as I described at the beginning, we need to introduce some sort of regularization or some sort of preferences expressed in terms of um, how we uh, go about minimizing um, uh, some function to get a optimal model in some sense. Now, um, the idea of looking for sparse solutions, and by sparse solutions, I mean uh, solutions which are encouraged to have many of their unknowns uh, at zero or close to zero as possible. Now, um, that may seem a little strange. It turns out that um, the idea of looking for sparse regularization or sparse models, um, chiefly given by the term on the right-hand side here, which is um, the left hand side is a data set, and on the right hand side is a model norm, what we call an L1 norm. I'm taking an L1 norm of the model and trying to minimize the combination of fit to data, and an L1 norm is a simple way of trying to get encourage a sparse model. And the idea of L1 norm in geophysical version dates back at least to the 1970s when Claire Bauta Muir used it um, to, essentially on the data side of the equation uh, to find robust data misfits. Um, and uh, John Scales in, uh, in the late 90s used it as a regularization term in seismic imaging, seismic tomography, um, to try and uh, find robust solutions to um, imaging, seismic imaging. So 
L1 regularization on the right then, I'm claiming encourages our solutions to underdetermined problems, um, it, indicating that we prefer the models to be zero, and we'll see why that might be a good thing in some cases, but it doesn't guarantee it. Uh, actually, if you're wanting to um, guarantee a truly sparse solution, we should put in the L0 norm in there. The L0 norm is essentially a measure of the number of non-zero components. Um, the L1 norm is just at sum in the absolute values. The L0 norm says we prefer um, a fewest number of non-zero components. And you can see how that directly means RPD. Unfortunately, if we use the L0 norm, we can't usually solve the problem because it's too hard. What we call NP complete, it's extremely difficult, especially as the number of unknowns increases. So L1 is a good compromise um, to try and get smooth solutions or practical solutions to these problems. Now, a fascinating um, idea that we'll talk about in a moment comes up when there are here figuratively um, all solutions to inverse problems are in the green, let's say in a problem, but all solutions are sparse are in the blue. And there's a particular case, and I've, I've said it above without definition, that when our sensor basis is incoherent with our model basis and the model is sparse, these two conditions I'll mention again in a minute, are the conditions of a well-known field of called compressed sensing. Now, what that means in, in layman's language, in simplistic terms, is that essentially every measurement constrains as many of the unknowns as possible. That's where co incoherence would encourage. And the number of unknowns that are non-zero are small. If you have that situation, then you're in this position where even though there's an infinite number of models that fit the data, um, because the problem's underdetermined, and there's always an infinite number of, well, a very large number of ways problems can be sparse, it turns out the intersection of these two is very small. And um, you can actually solve problems um, almost exactly, almost to a high degree of probability when the right conditions hold. Now, I want to jump to where this is coming in because um, this is the underlying theory of uh, Candace, Candace and Tao, Donahoe, Tolders, and uh, Felix Herman was one of the first people in our end of the woods, our discipline to, uh, to jump into this idea of compressive sensing. Um, now, compressive sensing, here's a simple example. More formally, if the data are represented as a sum of um, um, the, sorry, the, the, the data are measured by what we might call a sensor basis. That's the type of data we collect. If we're imagining a, a time signal as in the top right here, the red dots are where we measure the time signal, then our sensor basis, because we're simply measuring the amplitude would be a delta function. We could measure the frequency or we could measure the average over a period of time. There would be different sensor bases. Um, but if the sensor basis and the model basis, that's how we represent the underlying model, um, that, that might be constrained by this data, if they are incoherent in that data constrained many model parameters and the model is fast, it turns out that you can recover um, models with high precision. And in this case, I'm simply saying that my model basis are the Fourier components of the data. So I'm just trying to do um, simple regularize, uh, simple uh, regression. I'm trying to recover the data from the red dot. Now, if this condition holds where the two bases are incoherent, it turns out, that, and they are, if you use amplitude of a signal and Fourier components, many of these authors have shown that you can get near exact solutions with relatively few um, random samples of the data. And that's the idea behind compressed extension in a nutshell. And here's a simple example, okay? I'm gonna measure um, data on the left of some band limited signal, and I'm gonna um, try and recover the Fourier components of it on the right. So the right are my model parameters, the left are my data, and I'm only sampling at particular points. Now, uh, if I use um, a sparsity constraint, um, I use P equals one there, that's the L1 norm. P equals two would be the least squares constraint. We could try and 
recover the Fourier component from the data using an L2 P equals 2 approach or an L1 sparsity based approach. I'm going to show you very simply two examples of that. This is what happens if you try least squares on that problem. Uh, you, the green, the blue is the original data, the black is where I've sampled it, the green is where um, is the model recovered by uh, finding a uh, least squares solution to this where I'm minimizing the L2 norm of the data while trying to fit the data as well. And you can see that we fit the data exactly, the green lines pass through all the black data points, as you would expect, it's an underdetermined problem. You can always do that. But between those, the green is a very poor approximation to the blue true signal. We only know the signal blue at the black points. So we're trying to get the blue curve from the black points. And least squares will always give us something that looks like the green, which is because on the top here, um, we're looking at it in Fourier space. These are the recovered models, um, the recovered uh, wave number coefficients. And you can see that even though the true model is sparse as below, there are only 10 non-zero coefficients here. The top, when you use a least squares approach or uh, L2 regularization, you get essentially power in all of the wave numbers, um, because that's the solution that minimizes the L2 norm and fits the data. And you get poor amplitude recovery of the signal and many non-zero coefficients. So this is a classic example of a poor solution. And this was pointed out by the previous authors that this type of problem is very poor from an L2 perspective. Um, but if you require sparsity impose sparsity on the problem here. And this problem is incoherent in the way we sample the data, we pick an amplitude compared to our model, which is Fourier components. Those bases are incoherent. This is the type of answer you get. With, um, um, I've forgotten how many days I used there. I think about, oh, 10, yes, 10. I think I used about 100 or so data points. Um, so there are 10 finite coefficients uh, on the top right of what's recovered. On the bottom right, it's a true example, the, true, the truth in this case, and you see basically a near exact recovery. So this is using the same data, and all we're doing is changing from a, a, a regularized solution, which requires a minimum length solution, L2, to one which requires a sparse solution, L1. And the solution is dramatically different because this is the appropriate conditions for compressive sensing. Okay, now, where would this be useful? Well, as I mentioned before, uh, from Gantt, I put my quote in here, number of data that's growing. And he also said that it's 2007, we've been generating more bits of data a year that can be stored in all the world's storage devices. And so this has been taken up by a number of fields now, um, by this app in, in uh, the Earth Sciences on Seismology. Um, and we have enormous databases. Um, the idea behind compressive sensing is that um, we could perhaps not collect all that data, but collect random samples of the data and then use compressive sensing to either reconstruct the data, and if the circumstances are right, we can do so with higher accuracy, or use the um, limited data and um, combine the idea of reconstruction using the inversion as part of the analysis of the data. So it is a potential solution to um, recording really only the data that you might need and then using that to um, uh, in any application. Um, I'll give you a 2D example as a way of encouragement here. So uh, compressive sensing concepts have applications in image reconstruction, and the papers of C. Watkin and others have shown this. On the left-hand side is the famous um, paper, by, uh, paper painting by Escher. And on the right-hand side, at the middle, is 1% uh, of the data of that image sampled. And on the right, we've tried to reconstruct it. It's not that great, is it? Um, using sparsity. And we get a reason, we can actually see some of the structures of the waterfall here but it's not great. And we've used 1% of the data. And what's characteristic in these problems is that 
as you increase the number of data in front of reconstruct a threshold. And as you pass the threshold, the solution, if we're in the right regime of in in incoherence and sparse solutions, this is a sparse solution, we can actually recover this near exactly. And so here's the case for 10% of the data. And the recovery is pretty good. So it's only the data in the middle that's being used and the reconstruction of a compressive sensing algorithm on the right. Again, not perfect, but pretty good for 10% of the data. Now, this is not compression in the sense of adaptive compression. We don't look at the whole image and try and work out how to represent it, say in wavelets. We simply have the data in the middle and impose sparsity on it and try to, within the basis that we've chosen, and try and reconstruct on the right. So, uh, as I mentioned before, L1 sparsity constraints have a long history of seismic imaging, but the Earth itself is not known to be sparse. Um, so there's a problem. How can we use this in imaging and inversion when um, the Earth isn't necessarily sparse, or perhaps we haven't found the right basis functions that it could be sparse in? There are many attempts at using um, wavelet type basis functions. And I want to sort of uh, present what I think is an interesting direction here by um, uh, my PhD student with Andrew Lisa Tadunta, who is at ANU, and she's uh, looking at this concept of overcomplete tomography. Now, in this then, um, if you look at the image in the bottom right there, we have a smooth model. It's a simple linear tomography problem. We have a smooth background model given by the gradients. And on top of that, we've imposed a pixelized perturbation. Now, both the background smooth model and the localized pixel model are sparse. They're sparse in different bases. Now, the theory of compressive sensing works in a single basis. And the idea of overcomplete tomography is can we try and apply the same ideas to models that are non sparse in a spatial sense, but are sparse in two different bases, i.e., localized and long wave length? Can we better recover features where we have local anomalies on a smooth background? That's the motivation I motivating example here. And I'm going to show you some of Lisa's results in this. Just a movie. Um, on the top here, we're going to see results from an overcomplete in the overcomplete box and from simple least squares. And by that, I, I simply mean regularizing with a sparsity maximizing constraint on the left and on a, um, a minimum length on the right, an L2 norm. And we'll see what happens. On the left hand side, you see the ray density. And what we're going to see is a sort of multifaceted movie in a moment. Um, here's a, a, a typical overcomplete with a very only 10 rays in the problem. It, it's performed poorly. And the top is the, um, uh, the model. The bottom is the difference between the model and the truth. It's a simple synthetic case. And in the two little boxes, I'm showing you the projections in this overcomplete. The solution from the discrete case in um, E2 and the long wavelengths in E3. And what you're going to see, so here's the, uh, so the same, exactly the same data, here's the L2 solution. So in both cases, things have not worked too well. This is only 10 rays. But you can see on the right hand side, you very much see the rays, which is what you would do in an L2 norm sense. And on the left hand side, you see a smooth background with pixels. Now, what we're going to do is run a movie and look at the number of rays increasing. So, this is simple linearized tomography, a linear tomography, but the, mo the true model is not sparse in the combined basis. It's only sparse in the individual basis. And we're going to try and solve the two at once. And on the bottom left, you're going to see a movie of essentially the misfit, the fit to data as a function of the number of data. And we're going to increase the number of data and cycle through this. So everything's going to be moving at once. Let's have a look. OK, so you see recovered. So you're going to see recovered model accuracy. That's what it said, not fit to data. Um, now against number of samples, you can see a blue, uh, a gray, and a, a pink curve. And hopefully what you'll see is that as the number of data increase, the, um, the compressive sensing idea of hitting a cliff and the problem in the sparse basis becomes um, very accurate very quickly. Uh, we'll see that phenomena. Okay, I'll just try and play it. Hopefully you can see it. Okay, in 
my version of the movie, we've gone over the cliff now. And as we go over the cliff, the number of data, as we pass through that threshold, the overcomplete model becomes near perfect instantaneously, and the least squares model slowly catches up. And when the data overwhelm both, both become reasonably good. As we get large numbers of data, both will eventually get there. But I'll just try and play that again. Maybe I can play that again. Here we go again, so you can see it. I'll start the movie, and if you look at the middle, you should see it fits on the true solution and the, the error in the true solution, which is the bottom, go to zero as it goes over the cliff. It passes through the um, correct number of samples, which here is about 200 rays. You see? So that shows that it's possible to extend um, the idea of sparsity constrained inversion to an overcomplete regime and uh, try and recover models which are smooth and locally uh, anomalous. So we hope this will have um, applications in a range of applications. Um, there's uh, local structure on a smooth background, perhaps in a volcano or in a local earthquake setting or imaging subduction zones, etc. Anywhere where you have small features and large features, uh, long wavelengths and small wavelength features being separately represented and using the idea of sparsity to try and improve the solution for a fixed number of data. Okay, so oh, I'll go there. I will play that one more time because it's a movie for fun and I'm coming to the end of my time. And hopefully you can see that th this is just a, a first go at this problem, but we did not know whether in an overcomplete regime, this would possibly work. Um, the compressed sensing idea works in a single basis. These are two bases. It equally can represent the model. And it turns out with a bit of effort and a bit of tweaking and choosing your trade-off parameters in your regularization, which is the same you know, problems you have with all, all such cases, you can get um, overcomplete type problems to work. There's nothing about the linearity in this that is important you can apply this to nonlinear problems or any other pairs of bases or even more bases triples of bases or quadruples but the problem gets bigger and bigger and they um, more difficult to solve okay so i think i've come to the end of my first part of my lecture there and um i will uh, pause there as we reach 43 minutes yes yeah, so we're, we will reach 43 it's we will have a 10 minutes break, but Malcolm, are you disappeared immediately or you are still with us? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you are still with us. There is a question. I'm still with you. Ju just a very brief question because it's the last uh, last slide yes. was uh, really exciting in terms of the understanding the sparsity and so on and how it influenced the results of the inversion. Meanwhile, what about the model? If model